It is impossible to talk about teaching business English without mentioning the name Evan Frendo, the man who wrote the book on teaching BE. Evan, who has served twice on the BSIG committee, has been a member of BSIG spanning close to 30 years, is a frequent speaker both for BSIG and for major conferences around the world. We were very pleased to have Evan present for our 34th IATEFL BSIG annual conference with his plenary talk, Business English, a Retrospective, and a Possible Manifesto. This talk sparked a tremendous amount of discussion and interaction both during and after the conference. As a result, IATEFL BSIG and Evan wish to share with you this enlightening recording. We hope that after listening to Evan's wonderful talk, that you will see the benefit of becoming an IATEFL BSIG member and what our membership and our members can offer you. Friendo, past uh, coordinator and joint coordinator, over to you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here. I love I love this time of year. You all know that, uh, or many of you will know that I'm actually a bit of a basic addict, and this is the highlight of the year, which says a lot about me and how boring I am or how not boring I am. You'll have to make that decision. Um, I want to start by just clarifying that this is not a talk about Agile, but it is inspired by Agile. Um, Agile is a mindset. It's, it's based on a set of principles and it's, it's a way of thinking about how uh, people can collaborate together, uh, how people can um, deliver value. One of the things in Agile, which uh, if you work with people who do Agile, is something called a retrospective. And the retrospective is basically a meeting it can be fairly flexible depending on the organization but it's a regular meeting at the end of an iteration at the end of a stage in the process at the end of a part of a project whatever where people uh, come together and ask some questions you know what has been um, what have we done in the past what has been going well what hasn't been going so well how can we improve in the future um, and that's really the inspiration for, for this talk what i want to do is is look at um, various aspects of our business English world um, with these three questions in mind. I'm not going to be asking them over and over again, but uh, I'm going to be discussing the issues around them. Um, and hopefully by the end, we'll come up with a, a manifesto, a set of principles for uh, business English practitioners, rather like the agile uh, people did 20 years ago when they came together. Um, and of course, BSIC is an ideal place for this because this is our annual get together where we all share what's been going on and where we're going and how we can improve and so on. So um, here we go. Now, um, the, the six topics I chose uh, to sort of springboard me into this discussion are these really. The first three, academic research, publishing and testing, um, are there behind the scenes and are a huge influence on how business English is um, run around the world, how it happens around the world. So I'd like to look at those three things first. And then we'll spend the second half looking a little bit at methodology, business English teaching methodology, um, the way innovation is working, um, and then look at some disruptors, finishing off with a set of uh, principles or, or a manifesto. But before we do that, we really need to talk about this idea of what is a, a business English practitioner? I love this phrase, uh, Christine Johnson, one of the early um, uh, founders of BSIC, who, who wrote that uh, it's a term more widely used among practitioners than theorists. And this is very interesting because it's true. When you start going into the academic research, when you start going into um, uh, academia overall, business English isn't really a thing because it's such a, a vague term. But what I'm trying to do here is, is look at it from a macro perspective. I'm trying to look at the big picture. Um, so I'd like you all to step out of your, your own little context, as it were, where you're comfortable perhaps, or where you've been trying these things, and think, think about the big picture. Uh, since this is Zoom, I've got a nice uh, um, piece of realia here to, to help understand. 
Uh, what we're looking at is things like China with its 400 universities, which have um, uh, business English uh, as a topic, as an undergraduate subject. Um, so that's where people learn business English and they learn business skills to operate in an international environment. As far as I know, they're the only country in the world which offers business English as a, as a topic, as a, as a thing in the university. We're going to look at things like geolingual or, or think about uh, these, these big technology disruptors which are really changing. You know, Duolingo, they had an IPO recently, a couple of months ago, we discussed it on the basic Facebook page. Um, you know, billions, six billion, I think the IPO was. They claim on their blogs and on their website to have 40 million active users every month. 40 million active users. Uh, and this is really going to affect, I think, the way um, um, we think about business English, the way we do business English. Think of all, all the big data they're collecting and the research that they're gathering as they, um, as they deal with these 40 million people every, every month. We're going to look at things like, or, or think about a uh, perspective from um, a developing country or somewhere where, where you might live in a massive city, maybe some of the biggest cities in the world, but you have no access to uh, course books and other resources which are taken for granted in some parts of the world. They're very expensive in some parts of the world. Clients don't necessarily have a lot of money to spend on, on uh, business English training in many, many parts of the world. And so there is a much, uh, there are very different types of uh, business English contexts around the world. Um, thinking about my own context over the last few years, I've been, I'm based in Germany, but I've been working in, uh, in Korea as a consultant, working for an organization called Apex Sen in the maritime industry. This is a organization which looks after, it's called the Seafarers Excellence Network, and it's looking after training as one of the things it, it does, training of seafarers across 19 countries. So massive, massive projects, massive meetings with lots of very interesting delegates from all over the world. And one of the aspects of training, of course, is, is English communication uh, in the maritime industry, just like anywhere else, English is important. Um, so that's what I, I'm coming from. I'm coming from this macro perspective, this, this idea that we're not talking only about uh, our own context, but trying to think of the big picture. Now, if you look at business English practitioners around the world, as I say, they're working in all sorts of contexts. Uh, you can flick through this list yourself. You can identify where you are. Some, some of us have worked in more than one. Some of us have worked in maybe only one or two of these contexts. Um, for example, have, have you ever worked inside a company as a business English teacher full time embedded in the company for two, three, four years? Uh, that's a context which very few of us get the chance to do. Um, but it's really business English at the sharp end and you can do things there which you can't do perhaps if you work for a language school or freelancing between different companies um, or in the university working with pre-experienced uh, students. So there's all sorts of these contexts. And of course, practitioners vary not only in their context, but in their experience and qualifications. And so you can go around the world and somebody who's been doing it for one year is very different to somebody who's been doing it for 20 years. Um, in terms of the way they do things, their attitudes and so on. Now, one of the things I like doing on my uh, training courses is uh, discussing the nature of business English. And I like to get people talking about it in terms of metaphors, really. And this is one that quite often comes up, especially in the last couple of years. But, but of course, uh, it's always been a bit of a contact sport. It's a rough area. If you're a freelancer, um, or if you're working in a low resource country, or if you're uh, working in a particularly competitive market, business English can be very rough and tough. And uh, I'm sure you have all seen, as I have in, in Facebook, colleagues and friends who have decided to move away from business English over the last couple of years because they're losing work. It's harder and harder to get clients for all sorts of reasons, the apps, the technology, COVID, um, maybe changing interests and so on. But, it, but there's a lot going on and it can be quite tough. It can be quite tough when you go from one day to the next and you don't have any work. Shweta on the first day was talking about uh, India and how when COVID hit, hundreds of thousands of uh, teachers immediately lost their jobs overnight. Um, you know, so it can be quite rough if you choose business English. Other people see business English as a as we're just a small cog in a large machine. And certainly if you're working in a big organization, if you're working in a multinational, um, 
or if you're working in a large school or you're working in a big university where you don't really have much control on what's happening. You're an important part of the organization. You're, you're helping to, to make the thing work, but actually um, you are just a cog in a large machine. So I don't know if anybody feels that way about their own context. Um, because I've been working in maritime, my, some of my favorite discussions are about maritime. So we could be business English practitioners working in a huge organization. And some of us are captains of the ship, running the school, running the organization with years and years of training and experience behind them. Some of us are at different levels of the ship or doing completely different jobs, you know, from waiters to engine room ratings. But all together, they come together and um, work for the good of the organization. Um, some of us, of course, are like this fisherman. I took this photo in Myanmar, and this is a fisherman uh, on, on the river looking for his catch, you know, and what he gets that day um, suggests, yes, I can eat tonight, I can feed my family tonight or not. So a lot of us are working completely alone without any help, without any uh, other colleagues or co-workers or, or um no community of practice, really, just, just all by ourselves doing our thing and hoping for the best every day. Um, some people, of course, work with immigrants, with refugees. Uh, in America, for example, workplace English training, a huge part of it is helping people to, to come into society, to work in society. There's no money in this game. People don't get rich doing this sort of business English, but it's a massive type of business English. Um, and, of course, people are motivated by very, very different things. Some of us in business English don't actually do any teaching anymore. We're just there to train people who are going to see, uh, going to be teachers somewhere. So teacher training is a big thing. And of course, there are lots of people in business English who aren't actually teachers. I mean, we all know course book writers who have left the classroom maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago and have found a new niche as course book writers. And perhaps they're not, no longer engaged as much as they once were with the classroom teacher trainers, all, all these sorts of people are working on the sidelines of what business English practitioners are doing with their learners. Um, some of us are very lucky. We have nice, rich clients. We uh, get paid very well. We have a nice lifestyle. Uh, you know, we go into our classroom and somebody brings us a cup of coffee. Or we do training in a four or five star hotel um, with clients who can pay well. And this is a very different type of uh, business English to the others we were looking at. And of course, some of us are just working one-to-one. -one. We're not working with groups at all. We're working one-to-one, -one, perhaps coaching, uh, perhaps um, online, um, but a very, very, very special and uh, different type of relationship to the mainstream uh, of, of business English around the world, which is hundreds of thousands of learners or hundreds of thousands of teachers, oh. probably millions of learners all around the world, learning English so that they can progress in their careers so that they can work better in their, in their contexts. This is my favorite photo though. This for me is a really big picture of business English. This is a picture of a submarine. And of course, we can't see what's going on. Now it's full of very, very switched on people, very competent operators, maybe the cream of the, of the crop, um, they don't share their knowledge. They don't share what they're doing. And I think a lot of business English is like this. It's incredible. And it's always surprising to me how few of us actually um, come to these conferences, come to these webinars and share ideas. So many people I've worked with in the past have just disappeared into corporate training, disappeared into uh, business English training, doing it very, very well, very, very successfully. And we don't know what they're doing and they don't uh, join in, in, in our community or they take from the community, they lurk perhaps in the background, but they don't actually uh, contribute. So yeah, lots and lots of different perspectives of, of business English. So let's look at those six things now, and, and we're gonna go through these um, relatively quickly, I hope. Um, these are really just uh, six topics which I thought were useful as a prompt to think about some of the big issues. So the first one I thought of is academic research. It certainly it's, it's our main knowledge base in many ways of what we do. Uh, I don't think you could get a teaching qualification without having to access academic uh, research. And there are good reasons for that. It's, it's research which has been put together by people who ru know roughly what they're doing. It's normally peer uh, reviewed. So it's not somebody's opinion. 
but it's fact-checked and other people have a chance to say, no, that's rubbish, you can't publish that. Um, so it's actually quite a key thing in the background. And if you think about um, how much uh, research over the years influences what we do today, you know, from, from task-based learning, all comes from research, lexical um, approaches, you know, we now take collocations and things like that for granted in the classroom. That all came from research, from the co-build projects onwards, um, to uh, effects on uh, second language acquisition and how people learn cognitive neuroscience uh, you know we could we could um, have a huge pile of things which uh, is there in the background and and we get lots of insights from this um, research i mean here's one which many of the people in the audience will be very familiar with this is very well um, oft oft cited is the term um, well some people think that research is not particularly useful for teachers. There's some big names in our business, especially in English language teaching, who think, well, research, the teaching is not like that. And, and research is um, uh, perhaps not directly, it's too complicated to, to take little factors out and, and discuss comments and, and make judgments about things. I'm not in that camp. I do think that we can get a lot of useful insights from research, which then goes into our books, goes into the way we design courses and so on. Um, and it's something you have to decide um, in, your, in, your own, in your own world, I guess. But, and this is the big but, I think, this is where we've really, as a profession, as an industry, we're really struggling. You know, I accessed uh, this, this article yesterday, and this is what the website says, you know. And it's a lot of money if you want to start dipping into research. And this is expensive for me, coming from a rich country like Germany. I can't imagine what it's like for people coming um, from many, many other places in the world. And of course, you download an article and you don't even know beforehand if it's something that's going to help you or not, or if you want to keep it. And so the result is that most of us actually, sadly, don't have access to, um, to research. How many academic articles have you read in the last 12 months, 24 months? Can you name them? I suspect if you're doing your diploma, if you're doing your master's or something, you can probably name quite a few. But most practitioners are not really um, in the habit of, of reading regular research. And I think this is a real, real missed opportunity in many ways in, in, our, in our areas. Um, there are problems. Uh, besides just the pure expense, research is very time consuming to find. So even if you have got access, you have to search for it. And it's not only about finding it, but then it's um, reading it. You have to have certain skills. You have to have the academic skills to wade through the, the style of writing. You know, they're always, journal articles are always a certain length. They always start off with a literature review and abstracts and so on. And you have to know how to read and, and interact with this um, type of genre if you want to uh, get the benefits from it. Many practitioners think it's totally irrelevant. You know, if somebody's researching um, second ha left handed uh, business English practitioners from Mongolia in the 13th century, it's probably only going to be of interest to a very, very few people. Um, and so most practitioners find that research sadly is, is not uh, particularly useful. It's a shame, I think. And I think here's the biggest problem. Uh, when you start looking at the research, when you start looking at the journal articles, uh, and you start looking at the books, um, you look at the literature, and you look at stuff to do with business English, it's pretty much a small group of people who become knowledgeable, who become well known in that field. And most of these people actually work in university contexts. Now, some of them dip their toes into companies and or have had experience in the past, um, and or do their research in companies, but they're working in university contexts. And so if you if you try and analyze uh, how many practitioners actually get involved in this sort of academic research, it's very, very, very few. I've never published an academic journal article, peer reviewed, and I don't know how many of us have in this in this audience. Maybe you can put it in chat. Um, but it's it's actually quite a rare thing for practitioners to uh, to really get involved in research, and that's a shame. I, I was I met um, a well-known uh, theorist researcher in our area, and I was overwhelmed. You know, I, I'd read lots of her work, and I was very impressed to meet her. And uh, she sat there. We were at a conference, and she sat there 
totally overwhelmed by the fact that I worked in companies and I had ac access to all sorts of things going on in companies, which she could only dream about. So we were sort of slightly in awe of each other. And it's a, such a shame. This whole uh, disconnect between research and practice, I think is a big, big problem in our profession. Now, of course, there are other ways to share information, to share knowledge. Uh, BSIC is very good at uh, business issues, for example, the, the ongoing newsletter. Um, the conference selections are a fantastic resource if you want to look at uh, what's been going on, what people have been thinking over the last few years. Social media, the Facebook page is great. Blogs, fantastic. You know, there's so much, so much going on. But the problem is, again, this is very hard to access. You know, business issues is fine if you're a BSIC member, but if you're not a BSIC member, you can't really find it. And even if you are a BSIC member, you know, the, the team has spent hours and days and I don't know how many hours um, putting putting the, um, the the resource together, but it's not searchable. So if you want to look up a specific topic, it's actually quite hard to do. So research is not easy to access, even when it's not the academic serious research which we associate with universities. Um, I think blogs are really a way to go. Um, this is a, a shot from a blog post, um, one, of, one of the best blog, blogs around, I think, in our area. This is uh, Olya uh, Sergeyeva. I don't know if you're here, Olya, but um, she is a person who comes to conferences and then shares um, what she's seen at conferences. And then, of course, there's comments and discussion in the blog. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic talk. I remember very well in 2014, um, Charles Ray talking about uh, Agile in, in business English teaching, laying out a very clear um, approach to how to do it with uh, lots of samples from his own experience using Agile as a, as a way of organizing um, business English teaching. Fantastic stuff. The problem, of course, is that these blogs disappear into the internet and we don't even know about them. Um, they're not easy to find. They're not easy to access. You can find this if you type in Charles Ray Agile or if you type in Graz Spisic or something like that. But the sad thing is that unlike academic research, this sort of knowledge um, is, disappears into the, into the wilderness. And it's something we should think about and finding a way to solve this, I think. Um, another way to share, of course, is this thing called, some people call it thought leadership, this idea that um, there are a few people who, who share their ideas, share their opinions. Uh, maybe they're good, they're experts at what they do. And people start following them and, and, and listening to them and agreeing with them. And this is not academic research, but it's a way we share in our community. And most of us have people who we admire, who we follow, who we, we like to go and watch talk, who we like to go and, uh, and read, read articles and so on. It's a little bit like, um, well, if you think about the last two plenaries we had, on day one, we had a, a thought leadership approach to uh, sharing knowledge. You know, that was not an academic um, talk. That was lots of stories, lots of ideas, lots of opinion, lots of fantastic um, um, input. But it wasn't the same as the second talk, which was very much more in the academic style. Uh, both absolutely fantastic. Both of them have, have a really good place. I learned a lot from them and I know from the comments, lots of people thought they were good. But it's, it's, it's interesting that there are these two ways of thinking about how we share knowledge in, in our uh, world of business English um, and how we can make this better and how we can improve it. Something we, we really need to sort out uh, because things are just disappearing, especially as they're on the li online now. So that was academic research. Let's talk a little bit about publishing now. Publishing, well, um, I think uh, there's plenty of um, uh, research out there or certainly plenty of feedback out there that people use course books. Course books are there, they're used by the vast majority of people, maybe not throughout their, their careers as teachers, maybe not for specific types of courses, but for others, but publishing is there. Publishing is there and it's a huge influence on, on, on what we do as teachers. Um, and I like this, this quote from um, the Demand High, I don't know if you're familiar with Demand High, you can go into the blog later, but um, there was this whole discussion over the last 10 years, I guess, since Dogme came out. Dogme is this idea of materials like um, teaching. And, and this quote is, you know, it's a fairly drastic extreme to dump materials and syllabus and wonder naked 
through the dogme forest. And dogme, this, this whole idea of using minimal materials in the classroom and using the students as the main resource, using the learners as the main resource, um, is, is, is arose really in reaction to the whole idea of published materials setting the agenda. Uh, deciding basically what people did or didn't do in class and becoming quite strict about it. Um, not with publishing materials, but the way people use them. So it was a good reaction. Um, Dogme has this whole um, focus on emergent language, the need to people learn best through the conversations they have in the class. And these conversations have to do with their lives and to do with themselves. Then, then natural language appears and, and the teacher can then reformulate and give input. Um, and the process works very, very well in certain contexts. Um, Peter Wilberg in, in, uh, in the business area was talking about this, you know, in, in the late 80s with his one-to-one -one book, which several people I'm pleased to know <laughs> have, um, have uh, mentioned in this, in this conference. It won't go away soon. Um, I'm not going to talk about the pros and cons of course books too much. There's so much out there. I mentioned earlier this idea of um, using blogs to share knowledge. Well, I, I had a blog, which um, I, I've stopped doing now, but uh, was, of course, quite popular for a while. Chia, who I don't know if Chia is here this morning. Chia has a very, very good blog. And these blogs, if you go into them and start looking at them, and there's all, all the conversations and all the yes, but, and the arguments and discussions are actually um, quite good. And And this is the stuff we mustn't lose, because this is the stuff which really um, sets a record of what was discussed and how people feel about things and, and where people are in, in their life as a BE practitioner. And I know there's a need for this. I mean, my own blog, which was nothing special, I did it for a few years, it's had over half a million hits. Now, that's crazy. All that says to me is there's a desperate, desperate need for people to, um, to access this sort of information, you know. It's not because I'm a particularly good or bad writer. It's because they're just not out there. People are not sharing their, their experiences. And blogging actually has, has seemed to have died out quite a lot recently in recent years in the same way as it used to be with uh, lots of discussion and lots of comments. Um, you know, and I've been vilified on my blog, attacked viciously for my opinions, and other people have come in to the rescue and, and defended me. And that's how this sort of interaction takes place online and and i think it's a shame that these things aren't perhaps as popular as they once were but um what i'd like to just mention is this whole business english materials and publishing uh um and if you're not aware you you should be aware that eltj so english english language teaching journal uh, every few years commissions somebody in business english it's nearly always somebody from basic funnily enough over the last few years um, in fact, I think they were all BSIC members, the people I know who did this. Uh, I did the last one anyway. Um, and, and it's just a survey of the last few years since the last review um, and a discussion about where we're going with published materials. And they're certainly well worth reading. If you want to get a picture of business English materials over the last you know, 20, 20 odd years, it's, it's, it's well worth dipping into these things. And you'll find all sorts of familiar names. You'll find that the big course books from 20 years ago people have never heard of today, you know, and, 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 and so on. So it's actually quite interesting. But there is also a gradual change. And this is what I found when I did my survey, that um, in, in the beginning, certainly in business English, people were very critical of course books. The researchers, the theorists were very critical of, of business English course books, which were normally done using the writer's experience, the writer's intuition, but not so much reflection on what researchers were saying, not so much reflection on what real language in, in, in real companies was like. Um, and I think that's slowly changing. I think the, the world of research and the world of course books is slowly coming together. I mean, there are still still big issues, but uh, there is a, a trend uh, which is very clearly showing, I think, that um, course book authors are becoming more aware of, of the things that researchers are, are worrying about. Um, I think there are two key issues with course books, I think, which we still need to think about perhaps as, as a community, um, bearing in mind that a lot of us use course books, most, most business English teachers use course books, and some, some don't. Um, this Han Mike Hanford quote, I, I love his stuff, his work. I mean, if you don't know um, Mike Hanford's uh, stuff, you should, you should dip into it. He was one of the plenary speakers last year. 
Um, but this, this idea, we should be teaching the difference between what is possible and what is probable. In other words, course books in the past just said, yes, that sounds like English, let's stick it in. Oh, the space requires 20 phrases to interrupt in, in a meeting. Let's put 20 phrases of how to interrupt. And sometimes when you come in as a, as a teacher and you look at this stuff in the past, certainly and less so nowadays, you look at this stuff and say, yeah, but I would never actually say that. Nobody would say that. And there is no evidence, of course. It's just that the author had to put something in to fill the space. Now, I think that is changing. But this is quite a nice summary, I think, of what we as practitioners should be focusing on. We should be focusing on what is probably going to be said in the meeting, not as possible. Quite, quite a nice distinction, I think. Um, and another big issue, I think, with course books, and this is pointed out by Scott Thornberry again, he of dogme fame, um, is that the, there is always this problem that the course book is the method. The course book becomes the method. People just go in and look at the course book and follow it blindly. Perhaps they don't have time. There's all sorts of good reasons why you might start a course book at the beginning and go through right to the end and not be very flexible in how you use it. But, but this is worrying in the sense that course book is not really a needs aimed um, resource. Uh, the teacher is there or the trainer is there or the coach is there to extract stuff which is good or suitable or appropriate for that particular context, that particular group of learners. Um, and so there is this problem that certainly with people who are lesser uh, trained, perhaps less qualified, um, the course book itself becomes what people are doing in the classroom. And, and we should be a lot further on from that. And this is really all about teacher training. Both these things are about teacher training. If teachers start feeding back to publishers and saying, look, this course book's great, but, you know, why do you keep giving me a, 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 an article from the financial press in every unit? None of my students read the financial press, um, you know, that sort of thing. This is talking about business, but it's not the language of doing business. If we keep feeding this sort of stuff back to the publishers, then eventually the, the course books will get better and better, better in terms of um, their accuracy, in terms of reflecting what actually happens in workplace discourse international workplace discourse. You know, most of us know that uh, business English around the world is normally not with native speakers, yet the big course books are all really still offering a, a standard model based on some notional idea of what is standard English. Um, it doesn't really reflect necessarily the sorts of challenges, the sorts of strategies people need to develop if they're going to work in the in that international workplace. It focuses on language, but not on the skills of communication. Maybe these are things which, which course books can develop more in the future. So this is a teacher training issue, I think. Course books can be fantastic resources in the right hands, um, but they can actually dictate the situation in the, in the wrong hands, perhaps. So let's move on to testing, the third of our areas. Um, testing is huge in our business. Um, this quote, uh, you know, we've been playing with testing for years and years and years. The problem is that it's not easy in ESP. It's not easy in business English. Yet we all have to do it. We're doing it all the time. All these terms are, I'm, I'm, I would put money down that nearly everybody in the audience is familiar with all this, these terms and actually does these things fairly regularly in some, some way or another. Certainly if you look at the, the, the Facebook pages on for business English teachers, you see a lot of Questions like, help, I've got a new group, how can I test them? Can anybody recommend a free placement test? Can anybody tell me how to diagnose the levels of my learners? And this sort of thing. So it's part and parcel of, of, of what we do as business English practitioners. Now, one of the big things, of course, is um, the, the big standard, uh, standard tests like TOEIC. TOEIC, I think, is probably the biggest in the world. Uh, you can see in this quote uh, from their own website, which I popped into yesterday, 160 countries doing TOEIC, 14,000 plus organizations do TOEIC. Um, it's actually a massive, massive, massive test um, used all over the world. And of course, the washback, that means that it affects how people react in companies, what happens in the language training and so on. So it's critical that TOEIC and, and organizations like that actually test the right sort of language for, for what is being used in, in the companies. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of research to show that this is one example, um, that there is this gap between um, the TOEIC test, which is of course a general test, it can't be anything else, um, 
but the real world needs um, demand something else. You know, so when when you you go to your uh, company and they say, well, everybody's got TOEIC, that's not a guarantee that you can send your person from from Japan to India and that they'll be able to communicate well. All it says is that they've passed the TOEIC exam. And I'm using TOEIC as an example. This is a feature of standardized testing in business English in ESD. It's, it's a problem. It's a problem, which we're all probably quite aware of. I should tell you a, a small story of, of testing in my own life recently. Um, one of my um, sons uh, applied for a job at a German company, which is where I live. And um, there was a language test. And the language test was in two parts. First, they had to do a written test. And then they had to go in and um, have an interview or an oral test with the, with the in-house trainer. And so he, he did the written test and he did quite well. He's, he's fairly good at English. We speak English all the time at home, even though we live in Germany. So, so he did quite well in that. And then he went into the test itself, uh, to, into the oral part of the interview. And the um, trainer, apparently, and this is a story he told me, he looked at the test and said, oh, this is very good. Are you a native speaker? So he said, yes, I am a native speaker. And she looked at the test again and said, um, friendo, is your father Evan Frendo? And apparently that was enough for him to pass this test. So there you go. All you need to do to pass a, a test to get into a company is to have the surname Frendo and you're in. But uh, it's, 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 it's really a story to show the, um, the limitations of the testing systems we've got. They're, they're not necessarily particularly objective in reality uh, because they can't be. So back to TOEIC. Um, Rakuten, which is a quite a well-known um, Japanese company, and uh, it's, it's, it's in 30 countries. Um, but they're, they're well-known in our profession because they're one of the big companies that changed from Japanese to English oh, 10 years ago now. Um, and they made it their company policy. It was called Englishization. And this idea was that everybody had to learn English. It was done on TOEIC. Um, but what was really interesting is look at the problem with high stakes testing like this. If you didn't manage to get the right level for your job in your TOEIC test, you would be demoted. So the power of these tests are phenomenal in people's lives, in real people's lives. They affect people very, very, um, very strongly. And I think this is an issue which we, as the professionals in this business, have to be a well aware of so we can give advice as necessary um, and b keep pushing the testing organizations, really pushing hard to say, look, we need to be testing other things, not just the things that we have been testing. I'm not saying it's easy. It's really not easy to do, but it's something which we can be better at. I think. Here's another example community of practice. Community of practice is basically one of the biggest challenges in our business. People um, live their lives in communities of practice. In other words, they work with people, they live with people, they associate with people, and they get to know each other, and they adapt the way they behave, the way they, lang they use language as they get to know each other. And so if you go into any company, there are community of practice, and then departments have communities of practices, and professions have communities of practice. And they start using jargon, and they start using language in certain ways. Now, our job as trainers very often is to prepare people to go into those communities of practice. The big problem, of course, is that we are not a member of that community, and the learner isn't a member. And so how do you solve this problem of preparing people to work in a community of practice, which neither of you have been in? Um, and this is part of the issue with the whole dogme discussion. You know, you have to bring materials in to, to help this process. If you're working in a, in a company, you might bring in product specifications and all sorts of things from outside. You have to bring materials in in order to, to um, meet these sorts of objectives. But it's really, really very difficult. You know, how do you how do you test these situations? This is um, a Chinese friend of mine. She has a PhD, PhD in English. Okay, so her English is fantastic, and she she um, she recently got a new job, um, not in um, language teaching, um, but uh, she got a new job, very competent in English. And this is what she uh, texted me after two weeks. After being on board for these two weeks, I'm still struggling with understanding many jargons they use and the structure projects of the company. It's another world to me, project management field, as challenging as doing a PhD. 
this is because what she's having to deal with is not only about language. She mentions jargon, which is language, but it's also about how the whole community of practice operates, how it behaves, how it communicates. She's struggling. And now everybody struggles when they go into a new area, but it's our job to be able to help people to make this uh, better. So we're teaching strategies, we're teaching um, uh, skills which they can use to adapt to a new community of practice. It's not only about language here because we can't do the language. Okay, methodology is the next one. Um, some of you may, may know, I was very lucky 20 years ago, 20 years ago, so something like that, to, to write a, a book for uh, Pearson called How to Teach Business English. Um, I'd been a teacher for about 10 years, so I was very lucky to get involved in this project and, and, I, um, and I wrote it and it's been very useful to me. Um, and I sent, I, when, when I got this book published, you know, they send 10 copies to you. So I bought another 20 and I sent it out to all my friends, all my family, all my colleagues, um, saying thank you very much for your ideas and so on. But one person, um, yeah, most people wrote back and said, yeah, well done and congratulations and wow, yay and all this. But one person, Simon Gee, some of you may know in Leicester, Leicester University, wrote back just these lines, an optimistic title, Evan. And that was probably the single most aha moment of my entire business English life. You know, I had written a book called How to Teach Business English. And here was an expert in the field saying, <laughs> not that easy. Um, and, and that really made me think. Um, now, of course, we are now in the, in the post method era. So a long time ago from the 80s and 90s, we've moved away from this idea that there are ways to teach. There are certain procedures, there are certain techniques. We have moved away from that largely. Some people still do it. You know, my method is the best method. My method is the way most effective and so on. But most of us in this business don't follow one method or one set of techniques. We're fairly eclectic in our approach. Um, we, we, we change according to the context. We change according to who we're working with. We change. Adaptability, flexibility is absolutely key. You know, different locks need different keys. And I think this is absolutely um, part of how we operate in, in this business uh, teaching. It's not, it's not a way of doing it. There's no one technique. And this is um, well known, I mean, in ESP. This is uh, Waters, you may know. Um, Alan Waters, very, very well known writer in ESP. Um, <clears throat> And he, he wrote this article a few years ago, which said, look, OK, people say it's needs analysis, then design course, then write materials, maybe then evaluate. But real life is never like this. This has been recognized forever. You know, this, the people who come in and criticize and say you can't do boom, 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 boom. Nobody does it like that. And he compares it to a recipe book and an experienced cook. You know, a recipe book approach is maybe for beginners. They haven't done it before. So they go through the stages in the process. And it helps to teach and, to, and you learn how things happen. But an experienced cook doesn't operate like that. And certainly in business English teaching, as in course design, as in anything else, um, this flexibility, this adaptability is part and parcel and always has been really. And this actually fits in quite nicely with the whole agile idea of flexibility, of iterative steps. So you do things in, in sections and then come back and have a look. Uh, the focus on the customer, you know, you're adapting and changing all the time to suit your clients. So, you know, we're not doing things badly at all in, in, in many, many aspects. We, we, a lot of people in this industry know quite a lot about um, how to get a good, effective course organized. But one of the big issues we talk about and we hear a lot is this difference between learner-centered and learning-centered. And this again, Hutchinson and Waters, that's the same Waters, Tom Hutchinson, Alan Waters, you know, this was sort of the main book about ESP when it came out and has, it's on everybody's shelf. I don't know anybody in this business who hasn't bought this book. Um, you know, and they wrote a book called English for Specific Purposes and Learning-Centered Approach. And this has been fairly, fairly, um, standard approach in, in, in ESP for a very long time. Most people in ESP look at it this way. And it's this idea that learner-centered is fine. You know, it's best practice in many, many types of teaching. Everything revolves around the, uh, the learner. Um, the learner has full autonomy, the learner takes responsibility and so on. And those are all good. But actually there's also the whole idea of the process of learning. And that's what we're trying to help manage as teachers. And it's, it's a bit more than just the learner. The learner-centered is part of the whole process of learning a language. 
Um, and, and many people, I mean, the demand high people who I quoted earlier, they've talked about learning centers for years as well. You know, this is not a new thing. This has been around for years and years and years. This whole idea that it's a bit more than just uh, the, the student is in the center and nothing else matters. It's not as simple as that. And of course, in business English, where the client, the stakeholder is perhaps the person paying for the course is not necessarily the learner. Of course, they have an input. Of course, they have uh, an influence on what's happening in the classroom. It's not only about the learner. It can never be only about the learner um, if we're working in a business English type uh, context. Now, earlier I talked about um, trainer uh, competencies. This is one from a company. It's a bit adapted, but it's a basic I idea of what corporates are looking at in their trainers. Um, <coughs> excuse me the sorts of things a company might be interested in. Um, what's very interesting in this company was results, was the absolutely major focus for what they saw as a competent trainer. But you needed to have all these other things as well. And if you didn't have them, you weren't invited back. It was as simple as that. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of work on this idea of, you know, methodology, yes, eclectic, yes, but we need to have people who know what they're doing. Uh, it's not enough just to have a CELTA and then live on that for 20 years as a, as a oh, well, I've got a qualification, therefore I never need to do any more uh, personal development as a trainer. It, our, our business is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, I think many people in the audience will be very familiar with Equals and the European Profile Grid, which is another system. Um, this is going right across um, many, many organizations in ELT. This idea that you can categorize teachers according to their training and qualifications, their key competencies, their enabling competencies and their professionalism. So fairly similar in many ways to the corporate one I just showed you. And then you tick the boxes or shade the boxes for each of your teachers in your organization and you get a picture of um, where you have to uh, invest time and effort to develop your teachers perhaps. I'm not sure enough of us are doing this in, in our business. I think a big problem in our in our business is that anybody can do it. Uh, the client has no idea what questions to ask very often. So they believe the marketing, they believe the hype, they believe um, uh, a lot of things which aren't necessarily the best guide for who is a good trainer and who is not a good trainer or who's the best, better training organization or who is not so good. I'm lucky, I work in, in companies, I get paid to um, look at uh, training providers for companies and uh, give them feedback on, on uh, what I think um, these companies are really offering. And it's surprising how very, how many very, very good companies there are out there. But there are some really bad operators out there who use a lot of bluff and a lot of marketing uh, and a lot of bland statements in order to get their, their clients. So we're moving on to innovation now, just a couple more, innovation and disruption, and then we'll finish. Um, <clears throat> innovation, two types really in most, if you start look, reading about it, there's incremental um, innovation where you do things step by step. And then of course there's uh, disruptive innovation where, where everything changes because of some new invention or some new process or some new idea. Um, we'll talk about disruption in a minute, but first let's look at um, how incremental is working in our area. Uh, and one, one example is BELF. Uh, a lot of us know about BELF. Um, it's been discussed at the last, I don't know, 10, five, 10 years regularly at, at uh, BC conferences. Uh, BELF is this idea that um, uh, English is used as a lingua franca around the world. And it's not, uh, our job is not to be teaching a standard model, but, in, but we're teaching people to accommodate and to develop strategies in order to, to um, communicate in specific contexts, which are not a standard model because the real life isn't like that. Um, but BELF has changed. You know, we still call it BELF because that's sort of caught on, but nobody in the field is actually talking about BELF to mean business English as a lingua franca. They're all talking of English as a business lingua franca. Uh, and uh, Anna Kanranta, who was here as our plenary a few years ago, was, explained all this to us, you know, the, the idea that we're trying to emphasize the domain of use rather than the type of English. Elf and Belf are not varieties of English. They are English used in specific contexts, in specific domains. And Belf has been, you know, I mean, there's so much research in here. You know, if you want to focus on one area of business English, which is developing research-wise, Belf is exciting at the moment. So, you know, I, I learned recently about uh, Cops and Tigs. Now, Cop is 
community of practice. Very hard to read anything about Belt without talking about communities of practice because language changes from community to community. But uh, Marie Louise Pitzel, who's written quite a lot of interesting stuff about about um, international meetings and miscommunication and, and so on and how Belt is used, but she's come up with this idea of transient international groups, very, very common in business. So she's used business as one of her examples. And this is the idea that a community of practice basically develops over time, um, develops ways of behaving, ways of using language. But very often in business, people go in and they meet for the first time and they might never see those people again. You know, they might have one meeting, they might have one, uh, you know, visit to a trade fair, they have a chat, they sit down with somebody and then it's over. Um, and so now she and, and her fellow researchers are starting to look not only at BELF within community of practice, but BELF within uh, these transient international groups. Very, very interesting. And there's already, I, mean, I went to a presentation by her a couple of weeks ago on this. There's a lot of very interesting ideas coming up. And these will feed in into how we teach. Of course they will. Um, wealth. I don't know if you've come across wealth. I know some people in the room have, but uh, you know we have researchers here saying, well, wealth is only about business, trade, and commerce. But actually, maybe we're looking at workplace English as a lingua franca. Maybe there are things we can identify there. So it's moving out of the only the, the sort of focus area of business into the big wide world of workplace and English for the workplace or so workplace communication. So that's something may take off, may not take off. I don't know, but it's it's all fresh. It's all there. It's all buzzing. This is how this incremental innovation happens. You know, it's just ideas which come out there and some stay and some don't. Some come back. Um, translanguaging. You'd be hard pushed to read a Belf article now or an Elf article without coming across this word. It's, it's becoming very, very useful, very popular, but really helping people understand what actually happens when... Uh, people from different cultures speak English with each other, you know, and it's our job as business English teachers to know about this stuff. I put a link there, um, which uh, actually is, is aimed at teachers to help understand how to bring translanguaging into the, into the training context. Fantastically important as a concept and one which we've sort of ignored somehow, but I'm not sure how we did. Um, so lots of innovation in the research side. Um, Again, here's some more Belf, Belf research. Um, Susanna Ehrenreich, who I mentioned earlier, she did a very influential article a few years ago where she pointed out after her research, after evidence, learning seems to happen most effectively in business communities of practice rather than traditional English training. And we who have worked in companies, especially full-time in companies, know that this is the case. People don't learn English in our one hour a week or two hours a week. We might polish around the edges a little bit, but most learning takes place on the job while people are doing the job. Um, but it's interesting that this is still being researched and Takino recently, quite, influ quite an interesting person to read if you're interested in uh, Japan and Elf in, in Asia and so on. But he did a study here where he, he looked at how people are actually doing this. So, so Susanna Ehrenreich was talking about, it seems to be like this. He's actually starting to analyze it in, a, in an objective way, you, you know, using research. Interesting article, but she, he actually found out completely that this is the case. People are learning on the job. They're not learning from the teachers. They're picking up a little bit from the teachers. We're very small parts in the whole equation of these people building up their competence as language users. An example from my own world uh, of maritime I told you about. Um, this is a person in the vessel traffic service. So he's guiding ships in and out of harbors, exactly like, uh, in, in air traffic control, um, and we built up a huge corpus to try and analyze this um, this this communication, try and find out where the miscommunication was, where the where the problems are, so we could improve the training. And so the corpus came up with lots of uh, um, phrases like this. These are all the ships, the different ships from all over the world coming in. You never know where they're coming from, and. Um, Anchoring your ship is part of a standard process. We are dropped anchor because good morning, where drop anchor, my drop anchor time, and so on. And what we found is, although their English is not maybe standard English at all, it works. People have very little problem understanding this sort of thing. And that had a direct influence on what the training was doing. Because the training, here are some VTS operators being trained, um, was about standard phraseology, 
international guidelines. It was traditional grammar exercises. These, this group, particular group is Korean, but the BTS is everywhere in the world. Lots of role plays over the radio, just practicing, practicing, practicing. But what we found, of course, that one key need, which we weren't looking at, is this problem of dealing with complex situations. And the teacher couldn't do these because, again, the teacher isn't part of the community of practice. Um, and so what they what they did, and this had nothing to do with me, is they started bringing Korean, um, very experienced v BTS operators into the classroom, and they would sit and talk in Korean for two or three hours about situations they had to deal with, about emergencies and so on. And then the teacher, who had to be able to speak Korean fluently, would then um, sit down with the students and that expert afterwards and develop together some scripts which could possibly have solved the communication issue. And this is quite a nice innovation, and it's a sort of innovation which we're all doing all over the world in our own little context all the time. This is how incremental innovation happens in our business. We all try little things, and then we improve, and we find out where there's something wrong, and, and go on and go on like that. Um, Susan Black wrote this in a book, and I, I, it's one of my favorite phrases at the moment. She's a forensic scientist. You cannot train people for the unexpected but you can introduce the unexpected into their training. And that's exactly what it turns out we were trying to do in, in the Korean context. So disruption, um, I was able to bring Charles Darwin into a business English uh, talk. First time in my life, I was very proud when I found this quote. We will now discuss the struggle for existence. Um, one of the things about COVID, and of course COVID has hit us very hard. We've all been talking about it for the last two or three days. Uh, I don't want to go into COVID and how that's affected us, except to say this. This was a screenshot from um, communication on my Facebook page a couple of days ago, and I loved it. It said, this is from a student. I really want to attend the class, but I don't have fees. I don't want to bother you. And most people, I think, traditionally would have said, well, sorry, you can't pay. No lessons. But this teacher said, you're welcome to my class anytime. Please come and join the class. You are the best, thanks a million teacher. And I think I've, I've discovered that over COVID time, a lot of people in our profession have become a lot more generous in, their, in the way of treating people. It's not as hard nose. It's not only about business. It's not only about earn money, earn money, earn money, because that's the aim of business English teaching. You, most of us aren't teachers or trainers because we want to earn money. We would go and do something else. You know, very few people in our business really earn a lot of money. What are the disruptors? Well, no surprise, climate change, lots of technology, geopolitics, uh, Brexit EU has really hit our business in Europe. Um, I don't want to talk about these. I think we're all familiar with a lot of what's going on um, and they're very difficult to control anyway. But I, there is one I would like to focus on and that is this whole idea of noise, of fake news, of misinformation, cognitive bias, the way we think about things. Because I see more and more in Facebook discussions uh, social media, um, even in, in short articles and blog posts and so on, uh, and in conversations with trainers, you know, people get the wrong end of the stick. They're, they're, they're not spending enough time thinking about the issues. They're not doing the critical thinking we're all teaching our students to do, um, but we take nuggets and we, 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 we accept them from basic truth. One example is this, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with, the communication and body language. Um, Merabian's idea and he did some very specific research in a very specific context using one word at a time to, to look at how body language was influencing and how, how much of the communication was using actual words and he came out with this which was fine in his context and it went around the world and presentation trainers all over the world were suddenly teaching this as most of our communication is not in words. And um, this is a typical example of this fake news or this misinterpretation of facts, which uh, causes all sorts of problems. Another one recently, full of people from BSIC, in fact, this was um, Morrison wrote an article on, on the BBC, summarizing parts of what uh, Chia and Dale and other people, Jennifer Jenkins, had said about native speakers being Sometimes worlds communicate bad communicators. Very nuanced discussion, and I know those people, and they would never. But but this 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 headline was awful. You know, it it made it as black and white statement. And uh, I know, for example, I don't know if you're here, Ian, uh, but Ian got very upset about the number of people who are saying, "No, some native speakers are perfectly good international communicators. It's not as black and white as this." 
Um, and this has now been discussed in a, in a recent uh, JELF article. You know, we're having academics discuss the effect that this sort of misinterpretation, miscommunication has. Learning styles is another one. Um, you know, that, that came out. I put loads of stuff about learning styles in my own book, How to Teach Business English. I wouldn't write it again that way at all because I just accepted uh, what everybody else was saying without really thinking about it too much. People have been looking into it in a lot more now and beginning to react. There's a question for you. Any ideas? I was surprised. Needs analysis, 1921. Here's another one. 1920. Complete, com this could actually have been written last week, you know? Wild discussion revolves around Henry Ford. I took situations from the business world, specific to the experience of the individual student, and so on. And this has to do with this cognitive bias, this whole problem of frequency illusion and recency illusion. Frequency illusion is this idea that, you know, when you're pregnant, you see, you keep seeing other people who are pregnant. In this conference, I keep seeing coaches everywhere. They have never seen so many coaches in my life. Recency illusion, this idea that, uh, ah, it's, I've just learned about this, therefore it must be new. And as I've just shown you, you know, things have been around in this business for years and years and years. So, that's all I want to say, really. What I'm going to finish with is this list of principles, this list of ideas, a manifesto of where we might go in the future. Now, lots of people are doing these things. I mean, TESOL put out six principles of learning English uh, a few years ago, and it's become incredibly popular and incredibly um, uh, influential. What I'm looking at, really, is in our business. Area. And this is, this is a summary, really, of what we've been talking about. And I'll just read them briefly and then we can discuss them if anybody wants to in a question and answer. Business English is English language teaching, but also much more, lots of other disciplines. Needs analysis is fundamental to what we do. We need to work with evidence, not intuition. Different locks need different keys, so we need to be flexible. We need to think learner-centered, but also learning-centered. We need to work with emergent language, but we need to be prepared to do a lot more. Emergent language doesn't do it alone. Remember that we, uh, the language of talking about business and the language of doing business are not the same. This is the Mike Nelson we looked at earlier. Focus on what is probable, not what is possible. Prepare your learners for the unexpected by including the unexpected. Find a way of dealing with all the noise and remain critical. Be generous, share your ideas, your knowledge and your experience. And finally, if you think you know how to teach business English, you're being optimistic. Thank you very much.